stand together as we sing all hail the power of Jesus name And all he will continue to do. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. Good morning, church family. And it's so good to see everybody in the house of the Lord today. And uh, also, we're so thankful to have everybody joining us online today. You know, if you are a part of our fellowship, our church family, please know we miss you a lot. And we look forward to the time that you can come back and be with us in person. But we're also really thankful that we live in a time where we can do it virtually like this. 
And so we're going to trust the Lord not to even need our physical presence to speak a word to us because he is physically present every single place all at the same time. So whether you are here in our neck of the woods or literally on the other part of the world, we recognize that the same Holy Spirit is present here that is present right there with you wherever you are. And we trust his, his grace and we trust his word to break through all of these things that we put in place in order to say to us what he desires to. I have a couple of uh, good things I want to share with you. One is that, you know, um, we, we're doing a lot of things differently these days, but uh, we just continue to see the Lord work in spite of all of that. And uh, we challenged our church family this year with a goal for international missions over the Christmas season. And we've mentioned this uh, in a couple of different environments, but I don't know that I've officially done that on a Sunday morning. So we wanted you to know that we can celebrate because you uh, did come through. And our goal for our, for our Christmas offering for international missions, our Lottie Moon offering, was $20,000. And as of last week, we've exceeded that by about $1,000 or so. And it continues to grow because some of you all are still giving even now. So we just thank God for that. We thank the Lord for that. And, you know, speaking of, of faithfulness in that area, we uh, have baskets that are exits or entrances and exits if you'd like to give that way or you can go online and give or use our app if you'd like to do it that way or, or mail it in or even better yet those of you that can come by the office we love seeing you when you come uh, not just because you bring an offering when you come but we really do just love to see you you could even come by sometime and not have an offering at all and that'd be all right just come by and say hello but uh, boy, we love our fellowship, love God, what God's doing in our community, not only in our fellowship, but so many good things are happening as I talk to other pastors in our area and our community to seeing some really neat things that God is doing. And isn't it great to serve a living Savior, a living Savior who is risen and alive and at work in our in our world today. So, you know what, if you are our guest today, or if you have a prayer need or prayer concern of any kind, we have these cards that are placed around in the, um, in the seats. Please feel free to use that and communicate to us in any way you'd like uh, what we need to know, prayer needs or prayer concerns or anything else. One final thing before we go to the Lord in prayer is that, uh, I don't know, I, I uh, came across a, a verse of Scripture that is a familiar verse, but not one we talk about all that much. But as I uh, pray for God to continue to do a work through us in our community and even to the nations and, and listen to how that's taken place in other uh, fellowships from pastor friends of mine, I'm so grateful that there's a verse in Haggai that's still true today. And I want to give it to you as an encouragement. And if, if the Lord continues to lead me down this path, place uh, I may be digging in deeper in the message next Sunday we'll, we'll see what happens there but it comes from Haggai chapter 2 verse 9 and he's talking about the house of the Lord in the Old Testament the temple of course but I want you to listen to this and just listen to it in the context of you and me being the church during these days the pro God said through the prophet the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace. That's good news for followers of Jesus, to know that as long as we're here, as long as we are breathing oxygen, he wants to continue to use us to grow his kingdom, to advance the gospel, to be the church. So that's what we're going to be about. Let's pray together. Father, please uh, accept this time, Lord, as our offering of praise to you. And we ask, Lord, that you would do a work in our hearts. Please make us clean vessels today, Lord. And I pray that all that we say and all that we do would be very, very pleasing to you as we glory and, and honor and, and bring glory to your holy name. Father, we thank you for Jesus, for what he still continues to mean to us, to to do through us. Father, may your Holy Spirit descend upon this place. And I pray, Father, you would revive us, that you would revive our hearts and allow that to spill over into bearing fruit 
into the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue to worship, stand with us as we sing one of the great hymns of our faith, Victory in Jesus.
God can touch that and change it for his glory and for your good. Really get the message of this song today, church. We've looked so much at the outward things, been influenced by media and all that. We need to stay focused on him. And I want to tell you today that you are who our God says you are. He created you for a special purpose. If you keep your mind stayed upon him, he will fulfill that purpose no matter what is going on. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in.
child of God, shout amen. 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 Give him praise today. God amen. bless you. You may be seated. Amen. All right, everybody, let's take our Bibles today, and I'd like you to turn to one verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. And if this verse is not underscored in your Bible, it's, it's probably one that should be. So Jeremiah is in the Old Testament, and uh, it's not too tough to find. It's kind of a big book. So if you look in the area there where Psalms and Proverbs and the books right after that, it falls in line with those. So, you'll, so it's Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, right in there. And we're going to camp out at chapter 29, verse 11, for the rest of our time this morning. While you're finding that, let me ask you a question. How many things do you think you experience from day to day that are a result of decisions that you made in the past? We use the term sometimes, big, big doors turn on small hinges, and they sure do. And it might seem like a small decision at the time, but it could have long-lasting implications on life, right? Right? Uh, when I was in high school, I was a junior in high school, about this time of year, it was uh, around, around the last part, actually, I think it's February, now we're talking about Louisville, Kentucky, so uh, we usually get late snows and ice up there, and this year was, was one of those years. So I came home from school, we had, we had an assembly, which they used to do back, you know, in the day, and it was an assembly, it was a, it was a sporting event, it was a wrestling match. But this one, instead of being in the afternoon and evening, it was actually during school. And it was during the, six, the last period of school. We had these periods, and sixth period was the last period. It was a wrestling match. And um, so a bunch of my friends and I, or a bunch of my friends, we had talked about skipping out on that last period. Kids, any kids listening, I would not recommend that. I was, I was not right and wanting to cut out from school. This is for illustration purposes, but it really happened, Okay. So we decided that we might take off. Well, one of our it was one of the, one of the guys drove. It was back in the day when not everybody had their own cars at 16, okay? But this guy, he had a job, he'd had his license for a while, and so he he owned a car. And we were going to all pile into his car and take off. Well, again, before cell phones, so we had a hard time getting up with one another. I didn't get word to him that I really wanted to go, so about 5 of them left and took off. They went, I think, to some fast food restaurant. They were going to go and get something to eat or something. And I was stuck. And I was mad as a wet hen. And I sat there during that assembly. And even though I really wasn't in class, I was just really ticked off because they'd run off and left me. And I thought they were my friends is what I thought, you know, my best buddies. These were church friends, school friends, playing football on Sunday afternoon, those guys. But they were gone. And there I sat. So I walked in the door of our home after school, and the phone was ringing. And when I answered the phone, it was my mom, who was a secretary at the school slash church that, we, that was ours. And I had, when I picked up the phone, she said, thank God, you're okay. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, Mike and John and the guys have been in a wreck. Well, when you're, in a, you're a junior in high school, you don't, you don't think about what might happen or could happen. Especially guys, we're kind of dumb when it comes to thinking ahead, you know. And so I said, well, what, are they okay? And assumed they were. And she said, well, I think they're going to make it. But she said, John has a head injury and he might not make it. This is our best friend. And she said they're going to have to watch him for 24 to 48 hours, and then they'll know after that. I mean, long story short, John had severe brain, uh, swelling in his brain, which by God's grace, it did go down. Several other people in the car had major surgeries, pins put in limbs. One had all of his teeth uh, knocked out, and so had to have... Uh, all of that work done. Um, the windshield glass had cut cut them up in their in their faces, and uh, it was it was just it was a it was a mess. They had to use the jaws of life to to cut them out. I still can close my eyes and see the images of their faces. They showed that on the news, and they were 
pulling them out of the, of the back window of that vehicle. Uh, it was just a day I'll never forget. And Mike Clark, my best friend, he ended up being the best man at our wedding. I was the best man at his wedding. We were college roommates. And uh, Mike went to be with the Lord several years ago. But that day impacted him and his family literally for the rest of his life. John, to this day, is one of my closest, if not my closest friends. And to this day, he's in a wheelchair. He's very independent. He's very self-sufficient. But that decision, and basically what happened was they, they, were, they, were, right, they were going down a kind, of a, kind of a two-lane windy road in Louisville. It was patches of ice on the road. And they were passing. Um, no, no. A friend of ours that was behind them was pat, were passing them. Okay, I'm missing them. So you, you can tell how much I tell this. I don't tell this story very much. Um, yeah, the Mike and my friends were the car behind. A car was in front of them with some friends of ours. They passed that car, and the, anyway, they, they they sped up. One sped up, another slowed down, and they and and Mike and them who were passing the car had to get back in the lane that they had come from because there was another car coming. So they go to pass the car. This car speeds up. They're just playing around. They're just messing around. And so rather than pass him, he pulls back into the same lane. And when he did, the, the right front tire of the vehicle hit a patch of ice, sliding them over into the other lane of traffic. They were stopped by a telephone pole when they went to the other side, which left them exposed in the road. John, the one who's still in the wheelchair, was in the right passenger seat in the front of the vehicle, that the oncoming vehicle hit broadside. And I'm, I'm, I'm sharing all of that to say they didn't mean anybody any harm to anybody. They were just having some fun, even though it wasn't wise to do it. But that decision impacted them for the rest of their lives. Big doors turn on small hinges. Now, sometimes those decisions can have much more uh, uh, joyful outcomes than, than that would did. It, that, that, um, you know, that, that sword cuts both ways. Think about this. Why are you married, those of you that are, that are married, why are you married to the person that you're married? I mean, I don't know what happened, but what if you had not asked her out, or what if you had not asked him out on that first date? What if that friend of yours hadn't fixed you up? What if you would have said, no, you would have possibly married someone else. You're now, now all of a sudden, now your children are affected. Your grandchildren are affected. They're different people now, and your life probably looks a lot different. So think of the dominoes that start to fall when just a small decision here or, or, or there are, are made. Think about spiritually. What was it that God used? Who was it that God used in your life to bring you to him if you belong to him. If you're, a, if you're a child of God, like we just sang about, if you're a child of God in Christ, who was it that shared the gospel with you? A college roommate? What if you'd had another roommate? Was it a, was it a godly parent? You grew up in their home? What if you, we had nothing to do with who, who our parents were? What if you would have grown up in a home that had uh, non-Christian parents? Was it a revival meeting? What if you decided that you would just stay home that night or go somewhere else? So we've been looking at what it means to have godly wisdom during these days. It's the first few weeks of the year because the decisions that we make right now are going to have an impact on us and those around us, even spiritually from this point on. So how can we make sure that we're making wise, godly decisions? Now, we've asked ourselves a few questions the last couple of weeks. So just in the matter of review, or if you haven't joined us, here's how we began. We looked at the past first, and we asked the question, considering what's happened in my past, how do I act wisely right now in this situation, considering what God's already done in my life in the past? The second question we asked was about right now. Considering my present circumstances, how do I act wisely in this situation, considering what God's doing in my life right now? And we sort of based all of, all of this on, the, on Proverbs 3, 5, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not or depend not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. 
So we're not to lean on our own. We're, we've entitled this series to ha having an understanding heart. And today we're going to talk about having a wise and understanding heart. That's what Solomon asked God in that dream of his. God, give me an understanding heart so that I can lead these people. So we're going to talk about today decisions that impact our future. God does have a plan. He does have a purpose for every single one of us. So today, here's the question we're going to ask. What is the wisest course of action for me to take considering my future hopes and dreams? Now keep in mind that when I say my future hopes and dreams, I'm assuming that we want the same hopes and dreams for us that are, that are on God's agenda because he's much wiser He's much, much wiser than we are. The Bible says he knows the, the end from the beginning. Now let's look at Jeremiah 29, 11. I'll share the context of this in a moment, but here's what it says. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. All right, so before we apply these verses to our own personal situation, it's really important that we understand what's going on here in the life of Jeremiah and those that he wrote to. So there was a time, many times really, in the nation of Israel where they had really completely turned their backs on God and began to worship idols of the nations who were around them, and even, and even sometimes were living among them. And this is one of those times. Their, their leaders, the, the political leaders, religious leaders, virtually everyone, except for a few that would stay consistent and faith, stay faithful like Jeremiah. Well, what God would do a lot of times is raise up other nations, even nations that didn't worship him, and use them to discipline his people so that they would turn back to him. So it wasn't only to punish, it wasn't only punitive, it was loving discipline so that they would come back and follow the only one who could deliver them, which is God. And this is one of those times. So God rose, rose up the nation of Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar as his instruments to bring his people back to himself. And there were many people in the nation of Israel that were advising the politicians and advising the people and the religious leaders to resist Babylon. They're an ungodly nation. They don't follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This God is for us. He's with us. We are his chosen people. And, and many even of the prophets were saying, even if we go into exile, it'll only be for a couple of years. But not Jeremiah. Jeremiah was even considered a traitor by many of his own people because he said to their king, king, name is Zedekiah, he said, listen, you better not resist. Don't resist because if you do, this is God's way of disciplining us to bring us back to himself. So I want you to just listen to the context now of everything that's going on. And then, believe it or not, there's a lot of relevancy for where you and I are. So let's look back. This is really the message that Jeremiah is sending to the people who are going to be exiled in, in Babylon. Many, many already were. So he sends this letter. It says, verse 29, chapter 29, verse 1 says, Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile and Jerusalem to Babylon. He says, this was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the court officials, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. So what, the, what Babylon did is they took, they didn't take everybody into exile, when anybody left, but they took many of the leaders, the, the artists, the educated, some of the politicians, the religious people. This le or the letter was sent by the hand of Elasa the son of Shaphan, and Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, okay, here's what the letter says. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, 
to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them and plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will have welfare. You understand what is going on here? God's saying, listen, I'm sending you there and raise your families there. Bless that place. Bless that city. You don't want to oppose. You're going to live there. And if, and if you are blessed or if the city is blessed, then you'll be blessed at the same time. So Jeremiah, God through Jeremiah is just saying, this is, going to, this is going to take a while. You're going to be there a while. Verse 8 says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams which they dream, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. So he says, you're going to be there 70 years and then the promise, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your, for your um, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. The word harm there means not to do evil against you, not to send calamity to you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. But the greatest promise in these verse to me is verse 13. Here's what it says. God says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So this is good news because it means no matter what you and I are going through, God's plan and God's purpose for you is for you to be well. For you. The, the word there, we'll, we'll get to this, but, but the word that's used there for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Let's break it down. Let's just break it down. The first thing he says is, I know. Now, in the Bible, and specifically in the Old Testament, when God says that he knows something, usually it's, the, and especially here, it's that he has an intimate knowledge. This knowing, um, it was also the term that was used for when a, when, a, when a husband and a wife knew one another intimately. It's when we know one another by experience. Not just in our heads, but our whole being. Now you think about that. God knows you and he knows me better than we know ourselves. He knows everything about us. He knows, listen, this is the infinite nature of God. This blows my mind. God knows every single outcome of every single possible decision that you and I can make. Whether it involves your family your, your, your finances, your spiritual life, whatever it might be, God knows not only the outcomes of what you do, but the outcomes of what you could possibly do, humanly speaking. God knows everything about us. He knows your name. He knows the days that you'll be here on the earth. He knows what, what causes you pain. He knows what causes you joy. He knows everything about you. David prayed and said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Listen, if you ever feel like God doesn't understand, if you ever feel like God just doesn't get it, that is never, ever true. Human beings may not know, but God knows you. And then he says, not, I don't just, I, for I know the plans that I have for you. See, now he's telling this to those, to those exiles, to that nation, but his plans for you are personal. His plans for you aren't necessarily the plans for me and vice versa. So you can't just look at how I live or how somebody else lives and say, you know, I want that because God's plan and purpose is specific for you and for me. And it's his plans to prosper you and not to harm you. This is really cool. The word for prosper, you know, people in our, 
in our age, in our day where we live, when you think of prosperity, usually they think of material prosperity or something that's tangible here on the earth. The word that's used for prosper there is the same word that's used for peace. It's the word shalom. And the word shalom literally means to make whole in the Old Testament, to make complete or to make whole. So God's plan and God's purpose for them and for us is that we become that complete person, that whole person that he has in mind. Really, ideally, this is why he wants to conform us into the image of Jesus because the only person who ever became completely and wholly what God intended for him to become was Jesus himself. And now we have Christ in us. And while that may not be manifested completely until we meet him in eternity, he's doing a work in us right now to provide that shalom, that completeness. Uh, that chapter that I read mentioned some false prophets who believed, oh, they'd be in exile a couple of years. I don't know all of the reasons that God made this such a long season, but let me tell you some things that happened. During that time of exile, God raised up people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those stories of, of Daniel and his godliness and his, his courage and his bravery and his prayer life, standing up against persecution, all of those things take place during this exile. So the thing I want us to remember is that God was still at work. He was always at work, just like he is right now. It's just that sometimes he works in ways that we don't anticipate. That was, that's what was going on here. And then he says specifically those plans are plans to give you a hope and a future. They wanted their future to be back in their homeland back near the temple, raising their families, worshiping the one and only God. Well, you know what? God wanted that for them too. He wanted that future for them too. It was just that more than that, he wanted them to seek him with their whole heart. That's what he really wanted. And then the rest of these outcomes would fall into place as well. Plans to give you not just a hope and a future, but the one that he's designed for us. If you're like most people, especially young, younger couples, so, so young people, any students, young couples, this is true for everybody, but, but to you specifically, if you're, uh, if you're watching online right now and you're a young adult or you're a, you're a teenager or in those early stages of life, let me, let me share a couple of things with you right here. There are going to be some things in life that turn out differently than you think they will. And I don't mean that they're all bad. They're just different. And I, I hope that you're the kind of person that's got hopes and dreams and plans, and I hope they really line up with God's plans for you. But please listen to me. They're going to be different than you think they are. Because we don't know the end from the beginning. Only God does. So just as an example... You know, back, back in the day, I really, I when I was a kid, I would have never seen um, the divorce of my parents coming. But it, it happened. It wasn't because of anything that, um, that, that my brothers or I did. It was, there were many layers to it, but it, but it happened. It was, it was beyond my control, but it wasn't my desire. Now, looking back, I, I love the, the second mom that God put into my life, and she helped raise my brothers and me. And I, I can only imagine what life would be like without our extended family as a result of that. But at the time, there's no way that I could have known that. But it, it was different than I would have thought. You know, when we were 15 and 16 and getting our driver's license, I would never have, have expected that horrendous wreck that almost killed several of my friends and did change their lives forever. I would have never anticipated that. Oh, I knew it happened sometimes, but do we really ever think that it's going to happen to us? Turned out differently than I would have thought. You know, if I could go back and control things myself, um, we would have five adult children now instead of four. When Paige and I were newlyweds and then having 
uh, a couple of children. We would have never thought that she would miscarry one and we would, we would lose one of those children. We didn't see that coming. It turned out differently than what I thought it would. But, but it happened, you know. And when you're a young person, you don't think that way. You just have your mindset on this is how, not only how things could be, but how they should be. Okay, now some of those things that I mentioned, and, and, and they're different in your life. And they, could, they could be taking place not because of decisions that you made, but just because these are decisions that either somebody else made or God made for you. What I'm referring to when I talk about having an understanding heart, I'm talking about the decisions that we, that we make that, that God, for whatever reason, within his providence, within his sovereignty, he allows us to make those choices, especially those to follow him or, and his plan or to reject it. What I don't want is for you to be in a situation where one decision, one night, one date, one weekend, one moment devastates you and your family and especially your relationship with God. Proverbs 23, 18 says, There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Listen, my son, and be wise and keep your heart on the right path. Something else I would have never thought when I was a kid, even when I was in those middle teenage years, I, would have, I had an, an idea what I was going to do for a living, what God was going to do in my life, what I wanted him to do in my life. I would have never, please listen to me, never, ever thought that God would call me to pastor a local church. I so revered my pastor's. They were almost like, I mean, I know now that they were human beings that put on their pants one leg at a time, but back then I didn't think so. Back then I thought it was, it was, I thought it was Jesus and then my pastor. And I knew my own heart, and I knew that I wasn't that. And so for God to open up those doors and call somebody like me into the gospel ministry, it was just, that part was better it's been better than I ever could have hoped and imagined. And I'm sharing that with you because I've also shared some things that didn't turn out the way that I thought that they would that have been sad to me. But I can say this, you can grow through all of them, every single one. A few years ago, Paige and I had some really close friends that started to struggle some in their marriage and they were very active in the church. Um, he'd, he had either been or was a, a deacon. It's been a long time ago. Um, but the family was really close to ours. But they started to drift apart, drift along, drift along. And finally, they started talking about getting a divorce, and they did. Had little, had kid, little kids, a small community. So it was, it was, there, was, there was a lot of drama, you know. But then... Check this out now. You're going to have to follow me to, to not get confused. The husband of the couple, the man in the couple, started to kind of see the, the, his sister-in-law. So there's two couples, okay? The, the, our, our friends, husband and wife, the brother of the wife was married. They got divorced and the wife started seeing the husband from this. So they, these were brother and sister-in-law. Okay? They were trying to keep it secret, but people around them were suspicious. And the 12-year-old daughter of this couple looked to her daddy one day and she said, Daddy, please don't marry my aunt. And I want to tell you what his response to her was. This dad looked at his little girl, and he said, Babe, for all my life, I've done things for other people. Now it's time for me to do something for myself. There's one reason I want to share that with you. And that is, I'm talking about decisions we make today that are going to lead to certain results in the future. 
And I just want to ask you, 12-year-old girl going through all of that, do you think at some day in the future this dad might have some issues with that daughter? Do you think that, he, that they're the grandchildren that, that might affect the outcomes of that? And do you think, I mean, what does God think about that? He didn't tell me, so I don't know. But what does God think when someone that's supposed to be a follower of Christ says, I've lived for other people, I'm doing this for me. Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says, Do not be deceived, God's not mocked. For whatever a man sows, whatever a person sows, he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Now, why do we do that, though? Why, why do we make decisions? Because here's, here's one of the things that's true. Uh, we can see those things a lot of times in other people. You know what I mean? If that were, I'll guarantee, I know this guy. If that would have been a couple of years before that, if that would have been me doing that or a friend of his, he'd have been all up in his face. But sometimes it's easier to see something in somebody else's life than it is to see it in our own life, right? Sometimes we make those unwise decisions because we're listening to lies. We're listening to the wrong voices. Here's what I mean by that. People will say, well, no, or, or the, the, the voice inside of our head will say, nobody's going to find out. This won't hurt anybody. I'm not breaking any laws. God wants me to be happy. People do this all the time. I've heard people say some of those things, but they're lies. Instead, we need to hear the voice of truth. God cares and says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for your welfare, for your good, for you to prosper and not to harm you. So what are some lessons that we can apply here and take home with us? Let me just mention a couple here, okay? Here's the first one. Even God makes decisions today based on what he desires in the future. Even God does that. Check it out. When, when God knew, uh, first of all, Isaiah 25, 1, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago. So Isaiah is saying, you, you're doing things now, and you started planning them long ago with perfect faithfulness. A great example of this is David, man. You know, when David was a shepherd, God's priming him for Goliath. He was preparing him years before he faced that giant. So God's going to prepare him to face that giant, Phyllis, that, that, uh, that uh, giant Goliath, and he sends a lion to attack David's flock of sheep, and David killed the lion. And then he sent a bear, and David killed the bear. And then when David faced Goliath, he said, I killed a lion, I killed a bear, and you're going down too. Because God had pre prepared him for what he was going to do in the future. So what's God doing in your life? How's he preparing you now for what's to come later? Here's a second lesson. Decisions I make today are the hinges that open the doors of tomorrow. The people who didn't listen to Jeremiah, who resisted the Babylonians, listen, many of them, they didn't go into captivity. They didn't go into exile. They were killed. The king that's mentioned, Zedekiah, he was especially defiant to Jeremiah. The Babylonians, they ended up putting his eyes out, so they blinded him. But the last thing they did before they blinded him was they they took the life of his sons. So the la That's how cruel they were. So the last thing he saw were, was his sons being killed. So that's just why it's important to seek God every single day because we never know when those decisions are going to open a door for something major tomorrow. And that, that's really the, the final lesson. Number three, it's not too late to start making decisions today in light of tomorrow. Please listen to this. Man, we all blow it. When we blow it, when we're eaten up by guilt, let's listen for a child of God in Christ. That's the Holy Spirit talking to you. That's a good thing. You want him to convict you of your sin, just like I do. That's the, that's the way that we come back to him. That's how he speaks to us. And just like he said, you know, one day, Jeremiah, these people, they're going to come back to me. And when they do, I'm going to deliver them and I'm going to bring them home. 
You know, because of the decisions that we make, some doors really may close. But the good news that we have because of the gospel is that God can open other doors. Those closed doors, it's just a, I mean, I don't know why God opens some and closes others. He just does. When the children of Israel are at the brink of the promised land and, uh, and Joshua and Caleb say, yeah, man, there's giants here, but let's go and take the land. God's already given it to us. They say, whoa, now, whoa, now, let's just, let's just tap the brake on that there, hoss. And they didn't go. It must have crushed Joshua and Caleb. But 40 years later, when they're right back in the same spot, God had closed that door, and Moses didn't get to go in. By the way, God opened a different door from Moses, and he took him home. Moses would not have traded the promised land here for the promised land there. But when that group of people came to the same place, they had, God gave them the opportunity again. He swung that door open, and this time they walked through. So let me just mention the questions one more time. Because I don't know what it is that you're facing. You think about it, though. What's that decision that you need to make? Considering what God's done in your past, how do you act wisely now? Considering your present circumstances and where God has you, how do you act wisely in that situation? And now, considering the future hopes and dreams he has for you, where will it lead if you make the decisions that you make today? And think about what your life would look like if you use that filter. Think about a, think about a, co- I was thinking about a coffee filter this morning. Think of a coffee filter and how you put that coffee in there and you pour the water in there and it filters out all, everything that's not supposed to be in coffee, it filters out. What if as a filter of our life, we ask ourselves, in light of all these things, what's the wise thing, what's the godly thing for me to do right now? And you know what? I know that I'm talking to some people right now that you're in spiritual exile. You're away from the Lord. You walked away from God years or months ago. You think because of a decision that you made or statements that you made or, or habits or sins that you've been practicing, you're thinking that you've blown it. You're thinking that your life, as far as having a relationship with God is concerned, you've blown that. That train has left the station. Can I just respectfully say to you, you are wrong. How do I know you're wrong? Because the Bible says if we confess our sin, that he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Jesus came to deliver us from that spiritual exile. Maybe you've been a, maybe you're a follower of Jesus and you, you, you mentally have checked out This past year, there's been so much anger, there's been so much pain, there's been so much hurt, and you just have thrown up your hands and given up. Please, come back. Go home. Come home with Jesus. We sang a few minutes ago, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm a child of God. So you know what God's plan is for you? God's plan is not that you just suffer, not even that you just live and that we waller in some of the poor or unwise decisions that you make. His plan for you and me is that we turn our hearts to Jesus, that we, that we turn to him, that we seek him with all of our heart, and the way that we do that is through Christ. So I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, please. Let's just spend some time doing business with the Lord before we go. John and the musicians and the team is going to come and lead us in a time of commitment. And I would just ask you, where are you right now? Where are you? Where does God have you in this season of your life? Start with your relationship with Him. What habits, what behaviors are you practicing every day? And Spiritually, where if you continue them, where will they lead you tomorrow or a week from now or five years or ten years from now? Or you know what? Here's the thing. Remember this. While we're just in the spirit of prayer, would you keep in mind that as far as the future is concerned, your future will not end when you die. 
there's an eternity out there. And the decisions that you make today with regard to who Jesus is and what he's requiring from you will impact your eternity and maybe even the eternity of people around us. So don't only think about the things that you may need to start doing. What, what is it that you need to stop doing today that's not going to take you down the right path? The biblical word is repentance. So stop, confess, do an about faith, trust him. We're going to stand in a moment, and when we do, that is an invitation for you to come for any reason at all. If you need prayer this morning or you want to make a public commitment of some kind, please feel free to do that. If you're at home or if you're listening to this at a different time of the week, would you bow your head and close your eyes even during this time and ask God to continue to do a fresh work for you. And think about what it would mean for you to, to seek Him, to trust Him and to seek Him every day with all your heart. Lord Jesus, Thank you for coming to set us free from exile. Lord, please forgive us for sometimes even willingly stepping back into that state. Would you show us, Lord, wake us up and deliver us. And do so, please, in the name of Jesus. Amen.